Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Getting Started with Excel. Uh, my name's Sean, I'm an e-research analyst at Intersect, and joining me today are my colleagues, John Jo, who is the Intersect e-research training specialist at the University of Sydney, and Abdullah, who is the Intersect e-research analyst at the University of Newcastle. Before we get started, though, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and their connections to the land, sea and community. Uh, we pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Uh, so three of us, we actually come from a company called Intersect. Um, and in case you're unaware, we're actually a not-for-profit membership-based e-research organisation. And we operate across five states and territories within Australia. We were formed initially in 2008, and we are governed by a consortium of 12 Australian universities who are our members. Um, we provide universities and their researchers with advice on the use of technology in research. Uh, we provide training in research technology and tools, and we also have the capability to develop high quality software for research use cases. Uh, here's a list of our current members. Many of you joining today are from a current member. We're, and they're mostly New South Wales universities, but also have a presence in the ACT, uh, Victoria and South Australia. So Intersect, as mentioned, operates on this member-based um, approach. And the uh, model we approach, we operate on is through our e-research analysts. So they uh, are the primary interface between Intersect and the member organisations. Uh, they are based on campus uh, or not these days, probably remote these days, but they're embedded within a member university and they work in conjunction with the support framework of the member organisation. Um, this slide also demonstrates the cross institutional collaboration within the e-research analysts uh, who work together on shared problems and, and problem solving together. Uh, the e-research analyst is a role um, combines kind of IT needs analysis, business analysis, research and researcher engagement across a very broad range of research activities. Um, their responsibilities include providing advice, gathering research specific IT requirements, uh, helping guide the development and deployment of, relative e -re of relevant e-research services, and aim to increase the vis visibility and acceptance of good uh, e-research practice. One of the main services we provide, however, is in training you know, across various research technologies. So they're delivered um, both in person and online. Uh, our interactive hands-on training is designed to improve research productivity and support world-class research by imparting key e-research skills and support to researchers. So since 2008, we've delivered over 1,600 courses and trained over 21,000 researchers across uh, our not only just our members, but also other research organisations as well. Uh, if you're interested in having a look at our full course catalogue and webinar series, you can um, head to learn.intersect.org.au. Don't worry, we'll put all these relevant links as we go in the chat, um, so you, you don't have to worry about writing them down. But we have a, <clears throat> a complete catalogue from beginner up to more advanced, such as machine learning and parallel programming. Um, and they spread across our hands-on course training as well as our um, webinars like today. We have two main types of training offerings as well. So we have our membership training, which is available to all our members, either through full membership, um, which is supported um, by an on-site e-research analyst as a specialist, um, <clears throat> and comes with a, lot of, a whole lot of post-training support as well. We also have affiliate members for our smaller member universities, who um, access four training courses per year. But we also op offer an open training service for those who aren't part of a member institution. And that can be one um, for a large research group, um, can organize a training course just for themselves. And we also uh, run our training for individuals, which again, I'll, I'll pop a link in the chat later on. But we run between 10 and 15 of these courses a year. Um, and they're open to researchers from any institution whatsoever to access our training. Uh, with our, our upcoming training, the training for individuals, um, there's a link there. Again, I'll um, share it in the chat. But we have Getting Started with Invivo coming up uh, in two weeks from today. We are running our second REDCap course, Longitudinal Trials with REDCap, on the 2nd of September, uh, one that's particularly relevant to 
the audience today, we are running the Excel for Researchers course on the 14th of September. And then our Learn to Program uh, in our course is uh, running on the 30th of September. Now, uh, this is just the current quarter three schedule. We will have another schedule coming out for quarter four. Um, all these courses are open for registration right now. And um, we do offer uh, early bird registration discounts, which are up to 50% off for current students as well. Uh, in terms of our webinar series, which we're doing today, so this is our first delivery of this um, getting started with Excel. Um, but this series is fully open um, and it's just suitable for HDR students, researchers and professional staff. Uh, and we've been running this series for about a year now. Uh, already delivered so far this year, we have had our start coding without hesitation, thinking like a computer and our survey tools in research, um, Red Cap and Qualtrics was last month. And coming up soon, we have our uh, research computing, uh, high performance computing versus cloud computing. Now, uh, these webinars are all recorded. So today's being recorded and they are available to review online um, uh, at your leisure later on. So following today's presentation, well, during today, we'll also have, um, we'll of course have some time for Q&A uh, as normal, but we'd also like to invite everyone afterwards, anyone who would like some more uh, bespoke advice, maybe have some very specific questions to their researchers when it comes to Excel, or maybe wants to chat a little bit more about uh, what we do at Intersect. Uh, you can join this Zoom link. Um, myself and the other presenters will all be in there and we can have a bit more of an in-depth chat uh, specifically about your own research needs. Now that room will um, open up at the conclusion of today's Q&A. We'll let you know um, when it's ready to go. And again, I'll obviously share the link in the chat for you all. Now, today's webinar is largely going to be a, um, a demonstration, live demonstration in Excel. Now it's based upon our um, our getting our Excel for researchers course. So what you'll see today, the idea isn't really to be able to follow along and be able to learn these things. It's more demonstrating what is um, what Excel is capable of in helping you with your research, and and seeing some of the elements of what we actually teach in the course. So I'm going to start off. We're going to just have some, some very basics of Excel. Um, so, you know, if you're an experienced Excel user, you might find this next five minutes a little bit dry, but the whole idea is to just make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of using Excel. Okay. <clears throat> so here should be a pretty familiar Excel layout for everyone. Like I said, I'm gonna go through the absolute basics. Now, when we talk about Excel, Excel's the program. Um, what we and we might actually say, oh, you know, open a spreadsheet. In reality, our whole file is called a workbook. In a workbook, we can have many sheets or many worksheets. So you can see down the bottom, I've got two here: this raw sheet and this process sheet. Sean Joe is going to go into that a little bit more and explain, you know, the need for things like that. But you know, you might interchangeably hear people call these tabs instead of um, uh, worksheets. But in effect. We can have multiple worksheets or multiple spreadsheets within the one uh, workbook. Basic navigation, like all our normal um, Windows programs or our Office programs, we have a ribbon at the top with lots of different tools for us to use. Again, John Joe's gonna go into a bit more. But some key things we wanna know is, the whole thing about Excel is our formula bar. So our formula bar, you know, Excel doesn't just allow us to store data, but it allows us to do lots of different things. And so it's very important to know what is displayed in any one of our cells may not necessarily be what our cell contains. Okay, very important concept of Excel. It will display, can display the result of a formula. It can display a calculation but what's actually underlying that cell may not necessarily be what you're seeing on screen. We've also got a few different navigation cursors when we go in Excel. We've got our white cross, which allows us to select any cells or select sections. If we go into the bottom corner of our cell, we can see we get a smaller black cross and that allows us to copy. And now that's either copy the contents or can copy a pattern in our um, data by dragging one way or the other. 
And if we go on the edge of our um, cell, you can see I'm on a Mac that's today, so mine's a little hand. If you're on a Windows machine, you get that four directional arrow as well. And that allows us to pick up the contents of the cell and drop it somewhere else and move it around. Now you might be looking at my screen now and noticing I have this first column of hashes. This is kind of one of those first traps that a lot of people fall into. Important thing to know about Excel is it tries to make some decisions for us. And looking at this date column, hashes don't equal errors, okay? Hashes are Excel's way of telling us there's more important information in this cell than I can show to you. Now, so if we see a whole bunch of hashes, not an error. So our errors in Excel look like, you know, an exclamation mark by, and then, a, you know, something like name or error. Here is saying, if I showed you part of the information here, you might misinterpret it. So all we need to do when we have one of these is lengthen, is increase the width. Now, the reason it did that, because you can imagine is all of our other cells at the top, you can see, well, I've got some more text here. This says sunshine and then an open bracket, but it's actually sunshine hours. Excel's decided that it can display the word sunshine for us and we won't misinterpret it. Whereas in our first column, you can imagine if this cut off our last two characters and just said one slash zero three slash two zero, it allowed to misinterpretation. And that's, you know, in date data, that's pretty important. So whenever we see those hashes, really key thing to remember is not an error. It's a, it just means Excel can't display to you um, what it will do. Last little navigational thing we want to talk about is how we can jump around quite quickly in Excel. Now, again, I'm on a Mac. So if I say, you know, if I press command right, I jump to as far right as my data goes, command down, command and control, generally speaking, interchangeable between the two. So I can go pull up and look, if I'm in a column with an empty cell, if I hit command and down, Excel will continue to look down and stop when it finds a blank. Real nice advantage of that is if we have multiple data sets on the one page and we want to um, analyze them separately, when we go to select them, Excel will stop when there's a gap and it helps us check that we're not um, going into an initial data set we don't want to use. Now, one little last trick I do want to show is that point I made about Excel is not necessarily displaying to us what the cell contains. Here you can see my screen is showing you know, minimum 12.5, 19.09 for an average. Now, jean is going to run through these formulas. This is not what these actual cells contain. And one of my favorite um, tricks in Excel is the control backtick. So backtick's that key above your tab. On your keyboard, it's underneath the escape. And what it will actually do is flick your cells into showing what they actually contain. So before where it said, you know, it would show my minimum of 12 and a half. That's not what was in that cell. What was in that cell was actually this equals min B2 to B32. And another little trick you might notice is all the dates change to numbers as well. Another little quirk of Excel that we do spend a bit of time on in our uh, fundamentals course. So hopefully that's given a uh, nice little intro to some very basics of Excel, just some navigation and getting familiar. I'm gonna hand over to John Joe now who's gonna run through uh, what's actually part of our course and show some demonstrations on a much larger data set uh, than what we've got. If you have any questions as we go along, Abdullah and I will be uh, on the Q&A. Some we'll answer as we go, some we might save for the Q&A at the end, but um, yeah, don't, don't hesitate to jump in there. And I will uh, stop my share and hand over to John Joe. All right, thanks, John. Yeah, afternoon everyone, let me start my screen. All right, so hope everyone can see my screen nice and clear. So we'll be using uh, three sets of uh, weather data in this webinar. So the first one that I'm currently open is a BOM daily data. Okay, so I'll make it bigger. Uh, all right, so this first set of weather data was obtained from uh, Bureau, uh, Bureau of Meteorology, so BOM. Um, this provides the daily data observation for throughout three months for Sydney, New South Wales. So as we can see here, January, February, and March this year. Okay, so it contains some metadata showing all the background information where the data was captured, 
uh, where the station number, where the, where, where the station is. Um, following that, we have three tables showing the exact um, value of the observations. Okay, so um, I'll be using this simple data to demonstrate the important features in Excel, okay, which may be really useful for your daily work and your research. Um, to be more specific, we'll first sanity check our data, make sure that our data is clean uh, for further analysis. Okay. Um, we'll be using some conditional formatting to highlight our data and make sure it is all uh, makes sense. All right. Um, in addition to that, we're going to perform some quick uh, calculations to do um, some simple summary steps. Um, you know, extract some useful information from the data set. And finally, we'll do some sorting and filtering, um, you know, to, um, to reformat our data, okay? Uh, we'll also be using some shortcuts, uh, which I hope will, you know, help you speed up your work, speed up your data processing in the spreadsheet, all right? So the first thing I would like to do before we sanity check our data is to make a duplicate of our raw sheet, all right? So uh, as we learned from Sean, you know, these sheets have uh, anything to do with, uh, with this worksheet. You can, you can right click on the sheet tab and uh, choose to make a duplicate of the current worksheet. Okay, so I'm going to create a copy of the raw sheet and uh, rename it as process. Okay, so from now on, uh, we can focus on this process sheet to do some data manipulation, um, but it's always good to protect our raw sheet. All right, so we can right click on the raw and protect sheet. Um, Excel will ask you to give a password if you need, uh, but we keep everything as it is. So from now on, uh, if you accidentally hit the, you know, the delete key on your keyboard, uh, Excel will show up a warning preventing you to change uh, from changing, uh, make any changes to your, um, you know, raw, raw data. Okay, so you always have a backup. Uh, so don't worry if you accidentally did anything wrong. Okay, so in the process sheet, we're gonna clean the original data. The first few rows that we discussed, well, these are the very important information, but not quite relevant to the data processing procedures uh, that we're going to perform later on. Okay, for example, we're going to calculate some summary stats. Uh, these uh, metadata is not um, that useful. So I will highlight all rows, okay, which contains the metadata and simply right click to delete them. All right, make sure we leave the top header there, all right, because we want, we want to know which column is which. Same thing for uh, the second month of data. This time we include the header, all right? Uh, we delete the header uh, as, as well. And I'll just quickly delete the third um, section of our metadata. So now we have a fairly clean uh, data set, okay? Um, it's just one empty column at the very beginning. So right click on the label of column a and uh, delete this column okay so now our raw data is getting to the right ship um, shape um, so you know let's do some uh, conditional formatting all right so conditional formatting is one of the uh, i would say really commonly used feature for highlight your data based on certain conditions i normally find really useful when sanity check my data Okay, so since we have some maximum, minimum, and rainfall data here, let's highlight um, some useful, useful uh, information from the maximum temperature. All right, say I would like to use conditional formatting to highlight 10 hottest days. So the 10 days with the highest maximum temperature. So first highlight everything in column C, go to conditional formatting. Um, it has multiple options here, but let's first look at the top bottom rules, all right, because we want to highlight the top, top 10 hottest days. So simply go with top 10 items, all right? You have the option to choose from top to bottom, uh, specify how many items you would like to highlight, 
change the format um, you know, as you prefer, but let's keep it simple, keep as it is and uh, click OK. All right, so now we have 10 holidays days highlighted in, in red, okay? Um, next thing, let's say I would like to highlight the days with minimum temperature less than 20, uh, 20 degrees. All right, so let's focus on column B. So instead of highlighting the whole column, okay, I would like to use a uh, pretty useful keyboard shortcut to select everything, all the numbers in column C. Okay, so starting from B, uh, sorry, in column B. Starting from B1, I'm going to use Control Shift down. So this Control Shift arrow key combination is really useful if you want to highlight a certain range of data, depending on which, which direction you would like to go. You know, Control Shift down, Control Shift right um, is, is, you know, uh, what you need. Okay, so we have everything in column B highlighted. Let's go to conditional formatting. This time, I will go with highlight cell rules. All right, so here you can specify any conditions as you like, for example, greater than a specific value, less than uh, between a range, equal to a specific value. So let's go with less than, okay? Now simply do cell value less than 20 degrees. Okay, choose a different color. Green view with dark green text. Okay, so as you can see, these are all the days with the minimum temperature less than 20 degrees. All right. Um, other than that, we can also use the conditional formatting to highlight empty cells. All right, so you most likely will have some missing values in your data set and you would like to highlight them. So um, you can choose what to do um, with all the empty values or missing values. So first thing, I will highlight the entire data set using the Control A option. Okay, that's shared between Mac and Windows. Control A to highlight them all. Now go to conditional formatting this time. Highlight cell rules equal to empty cell. Okay, or equal to blanks. So we simply change the cell value, okay, to blanks. Uh, I'll choose a different format, okay, so we can see the missing values uh, more obviously. Uh, so I'll simply go with background color, I'll go with purple. Okay, so I don't think we have that much, uh, that many empty cells. We have one here, okay, and there's another one down below, all right? Uh, other than that, as you can see, there are a few other options in conditional formatting. Um, we, haven't, we haven't demonstrated data bars. This is really useful for um, simply visualize your data based on the, the values. Okay, so depending on how big the value is, Excel will um, present a data bar. So higher the, uh, higher the values, longer the bar. So let's give it a try for uh, our sunshine hour. Okay, so I'll select, please select everything in column F. So make sure this is sunshine hours. Conditional formatting, data bars. I'll go with the red, um, red color. Okay, and I'll do that again for rainfall. This time, let's use blue. Okay, so essentially you can compare these two columns together, okay, two of uh, with the observations together for longer, for the days with longer sunshine hours, we most likely will be having, you know, uh, zero or very little uh, rainfall, okay? So it's a good way to sanity check our data, make sure they all make sense before we continue uh, some further analysis, okay? So let's move on. For these missing values that we just highlighted, um, let's, fill them, let's fill them in with a specific value, okay? Uh, let's make it triple line, for, uh, triple nine this time. You may have different values, but depending on what you need, you may fill zero or, you know, some negative value. So doing this manually is pretty time consuming, especially if you have many empty cells 
uh, or missing values spreading over your data set. Okay, so I'll quickly show you how to do that pretty quickly. First, select everything, you know, all data, including those um, missing value. Okay, so we go to these find and select option, the telescope option. Let's go to special because blanks or missing value is a special cell uh, in Excel. Okay, so let's change the default to blanks. Click OK and make sure these missing values, okay, these two cells have been uh, selected. All right, so after that, I'm going to say equal to, so pay attention to the formula bar right underneath your manual, okay? So equal to triple nine. You may have a different formula, you may have a different value as, as we discussed, but let's use triple nine here. So instead of hitting the enter key to confirm my, uh, confirm this value, okay? Or to put a value in filling this value, I'm holding my control key, all right? And press the enter. So control plus enter is the another keyboard, um, you know, combination for auto fill your, um, your, your values. Okay. And that works for both Windows and Mac. So as you can see, both cells, okay, have been filled with a user defined missing value, triple nine in this case. All right. So one thing that I, find personally find it extremely annoying is that we always have to keep uh, scrolling up all right to see uh, the exact uh, headers for for each each column okay so excel fortunately has some useful uh, options to freeze these headers or freeze the top row for us okay so we can access the freeze pane option in the view ribbon okay so before we freeze the top row, all right, make sure the header is located at the top of your current view. Okay, so here we have the first row as our headers and let's click on freeze top row. All right, once we have done that, no matter where you are down below your data set, the top row is always there. Okay, and the same thing applies for the freeze first column so i won't be i won't demonstrate this uh, now okay feel free to try uh, if you're interested well another thing is we can we can freeze both the first column or the first and the first row at the same time all right so i'll unfreeze the pane first make sure our data set is clean nothing is freezed i'll simply click on b2 here all right because Depending on which row and columns you would like to freeze, um, you 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 can you can decide uh, which cell uh, which cell to click on before you hit the freeze pane option. All right. So this is where your um, your rows and columns that intersect. Okay. So we have I'm going to freeze the top row and the first column. So this is why I'm clicking on B2 here. Okay, so click on B2, freeze panes. All right, and after that, as you can see, top row has been fixed and the first column has been fixed as well. Okay, so this is a really handy feature um, to help you easily navigate through your data. Okay, you can, you can freeze, you know, as many rows or as many columns as you need. All right, depending on how your how your data set is structured. All right, so after that, I'd like to perform some simple calculations. Simple calculations, all right? So I'm going to calculate the um, maximum, minimum, and the average values, okay? And as you can see, I have left a empty row in between. Now, I'll explain why I'm doing that just in a minute. Okay. To calculate the maximum value for everything, all the numbers in column B, we insert a formula here. Okay. So it's pretty easy to remember, you know, max, 
for maximum, mean for minimum, all right? And feel free to, you know, search, search in Google, you know, Google for the correct formula to use. Uh, it has, you know, thousands of the, um, formulas available and no one can actually remember all of them. So Google is your best friend when you do some um, Excel analysis, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'll use the control shift down shortcut once again, okay, to select everything in column B. So I'll start with B2, control shift down to the end. All right, so these shortcuts, okay, works in a way that it will stop where it detects a empty cell or empty row. So this is why I have left a empty row in between. So it makes it easier for me to select the whole range. Okay, so the formula is saying B2 column B91, column here is showing you, okay, we are doing analysis based on the range, all right? And that's from B2 all the way to B91. We don't need to finish the parentheses, simply uh, click on enter to finish your formula. Okay, so I'll quickly do the minimum. I'll go to the top. Finish and average. Well, I can use, I can directly type the um, cell index, okay, if I don't want to, um, you know, click and drag. So B2, column B91. All right. And I always want to keep my, um, the number of decimal digits as, um, you know, minimal. Okay. So I'll select all the uh, summary statistics and I'll change the format from general to number. Okay. So number as a default has um, two decimal digits. Okay. So here, let's say I would like to um, apply the same functions on, um, you know, maximum temperature, you know, rainfall data, evaporation, and sunshine hours. Of course, you can do that manually again, okay, inserting all the formulas. But the trick in Excel is that you can do apply the same function simply using the copy and paste feature. Okay, so. What I'm going to do, highlight those three cells, right click, copy, okay, and move to column C, okay, right click and paste. So the, uh, so if you use the, you know, control tilde or the control back tick sign that uh, Sean um, showed everyone, okay, we can see uh, what these copy and paste feature actually does was, uh, you know, it pastes the formulas, okay, sitting behind each cell. All right, cool. I'll go back, okay, so we can, we can copy all the way, you know, and paste to evaporation in column E, paste, Okay, for the sunshine hours. All right, and they all share the same number format as the original original sets. Okay, so we'll I'll demonstrate more about this copy and paste feature later on. Okay, and finally, um, let's do some sorting. All right, so I'd like to arrange the daily, um, you know maximum temperature, okay, um, from smallest to largest, so in an ascending order. So what I'm going to do is, um, you don't need to highlight anything at this stage, okay? So simply make sure you click uh, anywhere, anywhere on your data set. What I'm going to do is go to the sort and filter option and custom sort. All right, so sort by, you have the option to choose any, uh, any column in your uh, current data set or your current workbook, okay? I'm going to say maximum temperature, 
from smallest to largest, okay? And sort based on values. Um, you may add more columns into your sorting feature, okay? So you will sort based on the first one and then by the next and then by the third, all right? So we keep it simple, sort only by maximum temperature, okay? So I'll click OK. And as you can see, our data set has been sorted, um, you know, numerically in an ascending order. All right, cool. And a final step I would like to demonstrate in this, um, in this data set is um, to do a simple filtering. All right, so let's create a filter to screen out the days with the maximum wind gust direction equals to east. Okay, so we say let E in the cell. All right, so again, let's highlight everything. And then we go to filter. So click on the filter option. This will create a drop down menu or a filter for each column in your data set. Okay. So simply, if you like to filter out the letter E for the east, okay, you click on, we click on this drop down and make sure only item E is ticked. Cool. All right, so we have um, all the days with maximum wind gusts coming from the east um, screened, screened out, all right? So to wrap up this first session, I'll simply copy and paste these future data to a new sheet for further analysis, okay? So let me create a new sheet called future. And I'll control A to select everything. Control A to select everything. Right click copy. Go to the filter data or filter the worksheet. Okay. And I'll paste into column, uh, sorry, into my cell uh, A1. Okay. I'll go with the first option, uh, normal copy and paste. Okay. So as you can see here, the normal paste option retains the data formatting, okay, all these conditional formatting that were uh, applied in the previous sheet. Okay, so if you really want to discard all these number formatting, keep, keep your data set as original, you can do with another pasting option. This is the paste special. Okay, so this option is only available. Uh, so for, for Mac users, you, you will see the paste special, but for the Windows users, uh, you will you will find an icon with one two three on that. Okay, so that is to pay special and only the values. All right. So now, as you can see, the conditional formatting is gone. Uh, but interestingly, okay, we have the dates and the time displayed um, uh, not properly. Okay, not displayed properly. It's simply because uh, Excel discard all the number formatting, showing you the actual numbers behind these days and times. Okay, so you can do this manually, all right, changing them back to the time format, back to the date format, but the other copy and paste option or the more convenient way for you to do is paste as value in number formatting. Okay, so uh, from this name, we can see it will retain the data and time formats of the original uh, data source. Okay, so I'll go with this option for Windows users. This is the icon with one, two, three, and a percent sign on it. Okay. All right, so I paste values as, um, paste the numbers as values and number formatting. So both the date and time column are displayed properly. Okay, so that's the end of first data set. And I'll save my work and jump to our second data set. Okay, so the next one. Um, here we're dealing with a much 
larger uh, data set. Okay, so let me zoom in a little bit. All right, so a much larger data set here, we can see uh, we have the historical maximum temperature, okay, that has been, uh, that has been collected at uh, these particular uh, weather stations since 1859 all the way till uh, 2019. Okay, so we're going to calculate the average daily maximum temperature for each day over the entire period, all right? And we're gonna plot it against the time so we can visualize the trend of the maximum temperature in Sydney, okay, over, over a year. So these kind of opt, uh, data processing or uh, data analysis is called data aggregation. We are aggregating the data for each day over all years in this, uh, in this data set. Okay, and the Excel function that does this particular work is called pivot table, which can be accessed underneath the insert ribbon. Okay, so to create a pivot table, again, you don't need to select everything. Pivot table or Excel will help you select everything, the whole range. All right, make sure you just click anywhere on your data set. Let's create a pivot table. All right, so you can see the whole range has been selected from row one to row number 58 at 1,763, okay? Uh, you may choose to put or place this pivot table in this existing worksheet, okay? At the same place as your original data, uh, but since our um, data is, is so pretty large, let's place the pivot table in new worksheet, okay? And I'll call it um, pivot table, okay, or pivot. All right, so we are entering our pivot table worksheet. So now you can see on the left-hand side, this is the pivot table output or pivot table re report. Click on this report field. You will notice on the right-hand side, the pivot table fields or the configuration panel pops up. All right, and this is where you can configure your pivot table, structure your uh, output, all right? So for the first, uh, we have four different areas here. For the first two on the top, filters, columns, they are reserved for more advanced pivot table design. You can create a filter, right? You can display your output, uh, you know, by columns. Uh, so we, don't bother with that today, all right? Let's focus on the rows and the values uh, underneath, okay? So let's first drag our first field in the data set to rows, all right? And see what happens in the pivot table output. So on the left-hand side, we can see that pivot table has outlined the year number, okay? Or the unique item in the year column and displayed in, in, uh, in column A for you, okay? So have a quick look through. We have uh, 1859 all the way to 2019, okay? With the grand total at the, at the very end. So since we don't have, we still haven't done any uh, calculations yet, uh, we don't have anything for the grand total, all right? So let me drag months, okay? To the, to the rows and days, day number to the rows. So now we have more information in the output, all right? In addition to the year number, we have the month number, and underneath we have the day numbers, okay? So for January, we have 31. For Feb, we have 28, okay? Uh, these are the unique, unique items, right? Cool. All right, and finally, um, depending on which column or which field you would like to summarize, you simply drag that particular field to the values uh, field, okay? So let's drag the maximum temperature to values. 
All right, so as you can see, the default um, summarization option is, you know, is the sum, okay? The, um, to change that, to change the sum to average, we right click on that column and go to value view settings. Now we'll simply choose summarize by average, all right? Because we're calculating average of the maximum temperature. Great. Now, as you can see, uh, the pivot table has been configured um, properly, all right, with a uh, one row for, uh, sorry, one column for the row labels and another one showing the actual summarization, uh, summary statistics. Okay, so calculation is done, but the pivot table is not in a proper format for the plotting, okay? Because we, I mentioned, we're gonna plot these uh, data, all right, over a timeline in order to show the uh, the trend of the maximum temperature. So we do need a um, column for the dates, all right? So at this stage, the year, month, and um, day, they are all in um, one column, okay? So what do we need to do is to reformat the pivot table. But before doing that, we, we said we're calculating, we're aggregating the data for each day over the entire period. So we're not particularly looking at a specific year, all right? So we don't actually need the year field in the rows, all right? Because this is a data aggregation, this is a um, aggregation for all years, okay? So to remove the year from the field, we simply right click on that and remove field. Right? Cool. And let me quickly reformat, change the format from general to number. Okay, so it looks tidier. Okay. Uh, let's reformat our pivot table, all right? So to access the pivot table design option, uh, you obviously, we have to click on the pivot table output. Let's go to design. Well, the first thing I would like to do is to flatten the pivot table, all right? So make sure we have one column for month, uh, another column for day, all right? So let's go to report layout show in tabular form all right so the current pivot table is in the compact form and we would like to display in tabular form all right so we have one column for months one column for day and as you can see we have some missing values here which should all be you know number one here all right for uh, january and also number two here for february all right so the second option we're gonna do is to repeat all item labels. Okay, so report layout, repeat all item labels. All right, so for the subtotal, well, they are a, uh, you know, these values are the average for each month, which are not quite relevant to what we're gonna um, perform what are we going to plot all right all right i don't want to plot them on the graph so let's hide the subtotal so go to the subtotal option and don't show subtotal. so this is how you hide the subtotal and finally in the very end we have the grand total all right you you may just leave it there um, but to hide it you can go to grand total and turn it on of rows and columns. So now our data is um, fairly clean. We have one header, uh, the top row as the header here, you know, all the month labels, day labels, uh, along with the average of the maximum temperature. Okay, so let's make a new plot, uh, but I, I don't want to do, do it here, all right? Uh, I will 
copy everything, copy all the outputs from our pivot table, right click, copy, go to a new sheet, rename it as plot. Here, right click, paste special, as we introduced earlier, paste as value and source form. Okay, because I do want to keep the correct number formatting here. Oops, I think I lost the, my selection, so I'll copy that again. A special values and number form. All right. Cool. So we have the months and day in one and one. Okay. Um, so we need a third column, another column showing the correct format or the correct weather date. All right. So what I'm going to do is to insert a empty column okay on the right hand side of uh, the day and let's rename it as weather date well so the function we could use all right is is the date function which requires three input year month and day and it can convert the day uh, sorry it converts the numbers into the proper date format Okay, so for the year here, uh, it doesn't really matter which year we enter, since we're not looking at a particular year here, but it has to be a leap year, all right, because we do have February 29th uh, in sitting there in our data set. So yeah, let's use 2020, which, yeah, which was a leap year. Uh, for months, this is A2, all right, this is the value sitting inside our column A. And for day, the value in column, um, column B. So 2020, comma, A2, comma, B2. Finish by hitting enter. All right, so to auto apply the same function to uh, all the cells underneath your, um, your formula, okay? Uh, you can click and drag, but since we have a fairly long table here, well, the easiest way is to uh, hold your cursor to the right bottom side of your, of your cell until you see this solid cross, all right? And simply double click on your cursor, okay? And it actually auto applies the formula to everything underneath, okay? So we have all the way to uh, December 31st, 2020. And what I do want to do here is to hide the year digit, okay? Because it's pretty confusing here. It doesn't make sense to show uh, our data as 2020 because uh, it is not for that particular year, all right? So what I'm going to do, highlight everything in column C, which is our uh, weather date. Let's go to the formatting section, more number format, okay? Because we're going to customize our format. Okay, so more number format. Since we're dealing with a date, let's click on date, a quick scan. Unfortunately, nothing here that comes without the year digit. All right, so that means we have to go to customize. All right, so let's go to customize and look for the, you know, the date format that has, that doesn't have the year digit. Okay, for example, this one, D dash MMM. So we have single digit for day and uh, three characters for, for months. Okay, so I'll simply go with that. You, you, can, you can define your own, you can use, uh, you know, double D, double M, uh, that's also feasible. Okay, click on that. So now, as you can see, we no longer see the year digit. All right, cool. We have a proper weather date in column C. Uh, all the temperature recordings are in column D. Now let's create a simple graph, okay? So I'll go to, I'll click first, click somewhere empty because if you leave your cursor on your data, 
Excel is too smart to give you an auto, you know, sometimes an auto plotting for you, a, a automatically generated graph, which most likely is not what you, what you want. All right, so leave your cursor as somewhere empty, insert a graph. Depending on what you need, uh, but I think a scatter plot with smooth line would suit this data visualization, all right? Because we want to see the trend of the temperature over, over the entire period. Okay, so I'll go with scatter with smooth lines. Now we have an empty plotting uh, space. All right, so um, from now, we can right click on the chart, empty chart, select data. So Windows users will see a slightly different window uh, as the Mac user, okay? So I'm on Mac, but the, the whole concept or the procedures are actually the, the same, okay? Everyone needs to add a new entry for your data series, okay? So since we only have one series of data, so let's uh, add one of them. Uh, to give your data a name, you can, you can manually type the name as you want, uh, but feel free to use the existing one in your uh, spreadsheet, okay? So for example, I have the average or maximum temperature degree C um, as the header of column D. So I'll click on that. Let it be my uh, the series name. For the X value, this is what you're going to see on the horizontal line. Uh, on the horizontal axis of your graph. Obviously, this should be our weather dates, okay? So starting from C1, sorry, starting from C2, okay? I don't want to, I don't want to include the header, so starting from C2, control shift down. All right, so the, keep, keep practicing, uh, always use the control shift down if you, if you are selecting the range, all right? Pretty useful shortcut. Uh, as for the Y values, First, before you select, make sure the box is empty, deleting the default uh, values in Y values. And go start um, from D1, oh, sorry, from D2, okay? And all the way to the end. And we have D2 to D367. All right, so double check. Uh, this is what you, what you have here. And for the Windows users, uh, you have the, uh, I think, a add uh, icon, okay, instead of the plus sign. But uh, yeah, this is how you do. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with my selections and I'll click OK to see the graph. Okay, so yeah, this is the, um, you know, the default graph that uh, Excel gives you. Of course, we can do a lot of things adding a few chart elements to make it nicer. Uh, I'll demonstrate that later on uh, in, in once we finish with our next data set. Okay, so I'll leave the plot as it is and come back to that uh, just in a minute. Okay, I'll save it work, I'll save my work and let's go to uh, our third data set. Okay, so, yep, yeah, I think that's the correct size. So here we have um, some additional data from the Geoscience Australia, uh, which is a government website. All right, this one shows the sunrise and sunset times. And what are we gonna do is calculate the day lengths. Okay, store them in column I from the sunrise and sunset times. And then again, plot it on the same graph that we just had in the previous spreadsheet. Okay. So first thing, uh, the sunrise and the sunset times here are all numbers. All right. So we as humans can make sense of these numbers, these times. We know that 448 is 4, uh, 4 a.m., 448 a.m. Uh, 1909, it's 7.09 p.m., okay? But a computer or Excel 
you know, it doesn't know, it only understands 448 as a, as a string. Okay, so if you're new to this term, a string is a commonly used data type for, uh, for computer. Okay, it can contain any characters, including, including the number that we see here, including all these um, letters, uh, even with the punctuations uh, as well. Okay, so take our sunrise time as an example. Uh, we have it, it is exactly three character string. Okay, so all the sunrise time uh, are three characters. Uh, with the first first one on the left, okay, being the hour component, and the last two characters actually the minute component. Uh, of the sunrise time, all right? So we need to convert these numbers to a proper time format so that Excel can understand. And so later on, we can easily calculate the daylights. All right, so let's use some functions to extract the hour and minute components from the time. So first formula that we're gonna use is the left uh, formula. Okay, so the left formula is to extract a character or certain characters from a string starting from left. Okay, so we're gonna apply that on um, everything in column A, so starting on A2. This is the text, or this is the string we're gonna, we're gonna um, you know, process, all right? And followed by the comma, use we specify the number of characters all right since we only extract the first digit or the first characters as the hour component we put one here double click to finish your formulas finish the formula for column c and then for column d we have the sunrise minute component which here we will be using uh, the right formula all right, to extract the characters from the right hand side of the string. So again, A2 here, followed by number of characters. So you might have different number of characters, or you might start from the middle of your string. There's another function in Excel called MID, M I D. Okay, for middle, you can go from anywhere in your, uh, you know, from, from your string. Okay. So we have four as the hour component, 48 as the minute component. All right. Okay. So I'm going to quickly use the left function to extract its, the hour component from the sunset. And same thing here, the right formula to extract the minute. Okay. So I can highlight them all and double click. Okay, so now we have successfully extracted the hour and minute components, okay, from our uh, time streams. Let's use a formula called time to convert both components into a proper time form. All right, so this function uh, works in the same way as the date formula that we've seen previously, okay? It requires three input, hour, minute, and second, okay? So for the hour component, this is in C2. For the minute component, it's in D2. Uh, of course, the input are separate by comma. And for the second, since we don't have anything for the second here, you may simply leave that as empty or simply put a zero here, okay? Now it's clearly showing 448A, all right? So that makes sense to me, and of course it makes sense to Excel. Uh, I'll quickly apply the same function to get the sunset time. Okay, so E2F2, zero, finish, double click. All right. Okay, so now we're moving 
uh, we're now here in column I, okay, so in which we can insert the formula to get the day length. So day length obviously is a difference between sunrise and sunset. Uh, so we simply subtract, uh, use, you know, subtract the sunrise from the sunset. So H2 minus uh, H, uh, G2, okay, so H2 minus G. You get something saying 14 hours, 21 minutes, all right? So this is the uh, day lens for, uh, the average day lens for January the 1st, the beginning of the year, okay? But it does show the second component here. So if you do wish to hide that, please, you know, perform the same, um, same step that, uh, that I demonstrated earlier. Select everything in column I, go to customize, format, okay, num num more number formats. Okay, this is time, but we want to uh, customize that. So we only display the hour and minute uh, component, okay, with, with no digits for seconds. So H column double N will do the drawing, okay. Great. So we are approaching the final stage of our uh, demonstration. We have got the day length calculations here. Uh, so as, as I said, I would like to plot these data series, okay, this day length series on the same graph in the previous sheet. So what I'm going to do, I'll copy this column. All right, I'll quickly hover to the second worksheet, paste into column E. So paste special values and number format. Okay, I do want wish to retain the number formatting here. That's good. So to insert or to add these column E, okay, day lengths into an existing graph in your worksheet, uh, we may select data, manually okay specify the access axis the y values given name but it's, there's a trick in excel okay so excel plotting support the copy and paste feature as well so which can you know speed up your work um you know pretty nicely so what i'm going to do i'll copy everything in column d uh, in column e including the header, because that one will later on be used as a legend for that data series. Okay, so control shift down again, select everything in column E, including the header, copy this selection, and go to this chart, okay? And I'll move my cursor to somewhere empty, just right next to the main title. Okay, don't right click on the grid line. Make sure you're next to your main title. Right click and paste. Okay, so this is a pretty neat um, shortcut for adding a existing, adding a column, a new column into your existing chart. Okay, so as you can see here, these, the new data series seeds pretty closely towards the bottom end, all right, because the numbers that sitting, that's, you know, behind all the day length values are really small compared with the, uh, with the temperature values, okay? So they're between zero and one, but we have um, all the temperature value above 15. So in order to present the graph properly, let's add a secondary axis for these uh, day let's start. Okay, so to do that, I will double click on this day lens data. Okay, a format data series panel will pop up on the right hand side. Simply choose the secondary axis for plotting this series. Okay, that's good. Um, let's also add the legend. All right, because at this stage, it's really hard to tell 
which data series stands for which. All right, so we're gonna click on the graph, add chart, uh, add chart element on the left hand side, top corner, and I'll go with the legend, and I'll put it at the bottom of the chart. Okay, so we have blue line, average of maximum temperature, orange line that gives the data. All right, and uh, I would like to zoom in a little bit. Okay, so we can see the fluctuations of the temperature um, easily. So what I'm going to do is to change the boundaries of our axis. Okay, so the vertical axis. So I'll double click on the vertical primary axis to change the boundaries. I'm going to click on the axis options. It's this uh, icon, okay? Set the minimum as 15, one five. All right, so now 15 is at the bottom of your horizontal line, okay? I would like to do the same thing for our day lens data. So I'll click on day lens, these day lens series, uh, sorry, the right-hand side, okay, the secondary, uh, vertical axis, go to axis options again, and let's define the minimum as 0 0.4, okay? Cool. So it involves a little bit of a, you know, um, test to see, you know, which, which value would give you the best um, presentation of your graph, okay? So for example here, I would like to align this grid line, horizontal grid lines properly. So I will go back to the primary vertical axis and change the major unit from two to three, all right? So I did try a little bit previously. So I know this uh, major unit, okay, three is the interval between each tick marks. Uh, it's the best value to give a properly aligned grid, uh, horizontal grid. Okay, cool. So uh, a few things left here. We do need a main chart title. So let's quickly add that at the top. Uh, we can say average of maximum temperature versus day length in Sydney, New South Wales. Okay. And you may add a axis title for both uh, primary vertical and also the secondary vertical. Okay, so primary vertical, we have the temperature in degree C. And the secondary vertical, we have uh, a length. The unit is hours and minutes. All right, so I think, yeah, this graph is looking uh, pretty good. And that's the end of uh, my demonstration. And we are approaching the um, yeah, 240, 250. So there are more configurations you can do to improve the graph, change the color, uh, modify the horizontal axis so that the curve align properly, okay, starting at the first day of the, of the year, ending at the December 31st. So these gonna be uh, a whole lot of more stuff covered in our hands-on training, okay, Excel for researchers. Uh, there's an open, uh, in, uh, open course available uh, coming up, okay? So, and we cover more on text uh, and data editing in the hands-on training. So yeah, please don't hesitate to register. And I'll, um, I'll hand over to Sean to, uh, yeah, to wrap up the session. Thanks everyone. Thanks, John Joe. Um, <clears throat> I've just shared that link again to the uh, post webinar support session, which will start imminently. We've answered lots of questions in the chat today. Um, 
But I think a, a lot of Excel is good. Um, you kind of need to have it demonstrated. So just to quickly wrap up, we had a couple of questions like where you can find support for yourself. Um, you know, for Intersect members, probably the key difference is we do have um, e-research analysts on site for your university. Um, you can ask us um, who they are. You can have a look at our website. Um, in front of that. There's also really good user forums um, like Stack Overflow, the Microsoft Tech Community. I think not only with Excel, but with any sort of research technology, never be afraid to you know, realize you don't know it and go jump straight online, jump onto Google, find these forums, because the chances are someone else has wanted to do it before. And I mean, that's kind of the best way to learn. Um, yeah, most institutions will have their own supply training as well. Like I said, uh, our members, this course, um, that this webinar was based on runs generally every couple of months, even more frequently at all our members. And um, we also have the course um, available for any researchers running on the, it was 14th of September. Um, and that's the Excel for researchers where we look at this um, material. Basically, to give you an idea, we work with the material John Joe worked with, but it's about six hours worth of material. We look more into V lookups. We play with pivot tables a bit more. We do some uh, data cleaning, look at concatenating strings, you know, capitalizing things, putting things in sentence structure as well. So there's a lot more we delve into. And um, obviously we, we go a bit slow, we repeat things and we can, you know, answer more questions like that. If you have any queries about what we did today um, or anything intersect and you don't have time to come to the webinar support session, um, which I will post in again. Um, feel free to email training at intersect.org.au um, and it'll get to one of us and um, we'll be able to answer all of your questions. But thanks very much for all your time today. Um, really appreciate it. I'm gonna duck out straight away and I'm gonna go over and start this um, post webinar support session. Uh, I have saved the chat for the person who asked, so I'll go through it and make sure those instructions get emailed out if you email me. Um, yeah, for those coming over, I'll see you all shortly.